So the first thing we do is we actually execute the binary unmodified and to see what we get. We can see it's actually draining the name pipes. Okay, so we can see we have some goals um, that are printed. So we need to follow these goals. And it's telling us now that we've reached the state where uh, we can set breakpoint in the debugger in order to uh, block the recovery thread. So I'm gonna break in the debugger. And I'm gonna enable the two first breakpoints which are at the beginning of the available function and when it's actually uh, calling the function to uh, send a notification. And then we're going to enable the breakpoint afterwards because it's one breakpoint that is after we block the recovery thread and it may mess up with the memory if we set the breakpoint now. Um, it's also telling us to continue execution. So now we can see uh, after hitting enter that the VM hangs. So I'm going to go back. We, we, we are in the vulnerable function, so the recovery thread has reached the vulnerable function. So we'll continue execution. And now we're uh, hitting the, the call to the TMP set notification resource manager. So now uh, we want to skip at least 32 of them. So I'm just going to hit go many times. A few moments later. Okay, so now I'm going to patch the memory so actually the recovery thread gets stuck. And I'm continuing execution. So we can see the memory has been patched. And now if we go back to the target VM, make sure uh, the recovery thread is stuck, so which is the case, so we can continue execution. Okay, so we can confirm that 34 enlistment, which is 22 hex have been uh, touched, which is more than 32, so that's good. So we, it's telling us to uh, unpatch the memory to unblock the recovery thread. So I'm just gonna go and unpatch it. And after unpatching it, I'm gonna set the breakpoints on the actual instruction after the recovery thread, thread is restored. And I don't need these two breakpoints. So I'm continuing execution now. We can see it has returned from the blocking state. So we're going to step over. RSI is the actual resource manager. It's testing the, chat, the state here. So now if we look where we are, we are here. So the decompiler hasn't been updated, but basically it's in B next and this means. So it's actually trying to fetch the next MRM fling pointer from the shifted pointer pointing to the enlistment and updating this shifted pointer. So if we look at our RDI, So we can see the enlistment memory has been replaced by a name pipe chunk, which is marked by the NPFR tag. So that's great. And we know the offset for the shifted pointer is at offset 88. Because if we look at the K enlistment, it's actually pointing to the next same RM field, which is at offset 88. So here, if we look at RDI, we can see that unfortunately it's going to get a null pointer, so the offset is wrong. But if we, if we actually look at RDI minus 88, okay. So what we can see is that what should happen is that we want RDI minus 88 to be a valid K enlistment, and we want that at index 88 there is the next same RM fling pointer. But as you can see, the pointer that we've set is actually before. So the offset is wrong. So if we actually print that as a k enlistment, You 
can see that at offset 88, actually, we don't have the, the right value. So here it's at offset 78. So actually, if we do a little bit of math, so we want to subtract, see where Okay, so basically at the moment, the pointer that we set is at offset 68 from the start of the canisment, but we need it to be at offset 88. So we need to offset 20 hex. So we want it to be plus 20 hex. So it's actually at offset 88 instead of 68. Obviously here, if we continue execution and we step over, now RDI is null, and so obviously it's going to crash. So here it's retrieving a pointer, and here R14 is 0 minus 88, so obviously it's going to crash. So let's modify the offset of the trap anisment when it's pointed from the spray anisment. So we know it's related to the k anisment offset that is given to the init spray anisment function because when we pass this offset here, it's going to actually be used to figure out where the k anisment starts inside the chunk, and we know we need to add 20 hex. So we're just going to add 20x here and we're going to push the binary onto the target VM. So we're executing the binary again. And so here we want to check that the next MRM fling pointer retrieve is at the right offset. So let's enable our breakpoints. We continue execution. It hangs. And now we're going to continue execution to hit the, our second breakpoint. And now we're going to skip 32 times at least. A few moments later. Okay, now we're going to patch the memory. And continue execution. So now our recovery thread is stuck. So we're going to continue execution. We can see it's freed more than 32 chunks, which is good. So now we can unpatch. And now we can enable our breakpoint post being stuck. Okay. So we know RDI holds the shifted pointer to the canisment. Okay, and now if we look at what is pointed by RDI. Ah, nice. So this is our user and pointer, as you can see, because it starts with zeros. So now if we actually print the canisman starting from RDI minus 88. Yeah. 
now you can see that the next MRM actually holds our username and incident address. So let's step over. So we can use F10 to do it from Git right cell. Nice, so now RDI has been retrieved. So we can see that the kernel is manipulating what it thinks is a kernismen, but it's actually the user and address that we provided. And so if we interpret that as a kernismen, Well, it's not really valid at the moment. You can see none of the fields are set. So let's see what happens. Okay, so when it's comparing RGI to L12, it's when actually it's testing at the beginning of the loop if the enlistment address equals the enlistment head. And so it's testing if it's at the end of the linked list, but obviously it's never gonna happen because now it's manipulating a username enlistment and it's comparing that to a kernel address. So yeah, sure, user and enlistment and enlistment head address. Okay, so let's see where it goes. So here it's testing the enlistment flags. So because we haven't set it, actually here it's never going to be finalized. So what do we want to do? Let's step. So now it's calling the ob reference object on the enlistment. Okay. So we know R14 is our enlistment. So now basically what it's gonna do is gonna actually increment in the object header, the actual count. So let's look at our trap enlistment. So we should have set the pointer count to the value A, okay? So the object header is 30 bytes hex before. So if we go back, here and we do btnt okay so we can see our pointer count equal 10 okay so now it's going to actually reference the object so let's see what happens Okay, so now you can see it's incrementing the pointer count to 11. Okay, so let's continue execution. Step over on the KE wait for single object. Then it's setting the BSEN notification to false by default. Then it's retrieving the enlistment sh shifted flags. Where are we? Yeah, we are here. Okay, so that's an interesting instruction. Basically, what is CL? CL is zero, so it's retrieving the enlistment flag from here, putting that into ECX, 
and then it's testing the lower byte CL and then it's going to branch depending on if it's signed or not and you can see the decompiler is saying if enlistment flags is less than zero so because it's testing a byte so it's actually testing if the higher byte is actually set which is like testing effectively if the enlistment flags has the byte corresponding to the hex 80 value set. Let's look at the actual flags. Okay, so Kenisman flags. We can see that the flag corresponding to 80 is the notifiable flag. So basically this code is equivalent to say if enlistment flags and notifiable flag is non-zero so it's testing if it's notifiable okay and so then what we want now is basically to figure out where we can set a breakpoint that will allow us to debug post race condition when we have won the race condition and so we're going to use a superior Kenismans. And so basically here we need it to be notifiable, then we need a valid transaction pointer, and then the state needs to be something that we need to figure out, and then we need to reach that specific case where it says that the transaction notify recover is used for the notification mask. So if we actually look at the disassembly for that, but the decompiled code is quite confusing. So where are we? So at the moment we're here, so let's see where we go. Okay, so here we just exited the if condition entirely, obviously, because the enlistment is not notifiable. Okay, so let's go back where we were. So we are here, so let's see what we want. So here it's testing the enlistment flags to make sure it's notifiable. So we want this to be the case, okay? Then it's not gonna jump, it's gonna continue. Here with the value one, it's testing if the enlistment is superior. So if we go here, the superior is testing the value one, okay? So we want this to be superior, because that's, that's gonna be a breakpoint in an area of the code that is never reached usually. So then this jump won't be taken because the end of the flag, this Kernisman superior flag, will be non-zero. So we're going to continue execution. And then it's going to test the transaction state. So RAX is going to be a transaction, as can be retrieved from here. And then it's going to retrieve the transaction state and it's going to test the state with two values, three and four. So let's look at the K transaction state. So three and four are prepared and in doubt. So what do we want? We want, we said we want to reach that specific instruction. So we want this jump to be not taken and we also want this jump to be not taken. So here it's testing if the state is three and so we want this to be not the case because we want this jump to not be taken. So we don't want this to be prepared because otherwise this jump will be taken and then we want the state to be four because if it's not four then it will be non-zero and so it will actually take the jump. So we actually want the state to be in doubt, okay? And then we'll be able to reach that state. The other thing we can do here is actually, because the debugger is attached with red sync, we can actually see where this breakpoint would be. So if we do control F2, and then BL, it's actually telling us that the breakpoint is at the TM recovery resource manager X plus 18C. So we can set that breakpoint in, in the next debug in the session. So to summarize here, we know that we need the flags to be not only 
notifiable but also superior. We need the transaction field to be set to a fake transaction and the state of the transaction needs to be transaction in doubt. So we actually reach that instruction. And the last thing we need is we also need the Kernisman next same RM fling pointer to be set to itself. So it's actually a trap enlistment. So I've modified the source code in order to reach our goal. So if we look at how we initialize the fake enlistment now, we see for the trap enlistment, we said we need the trap enlistment to be superior so we can set a breakpoint in an area of the code that is not reachable in the normal scenario. We need it to also be notifiable so it goes into this if condition and we need its transaction field to point to a real transaction and this transaction need to have its state defined as k transaction in doubt. This is so we enter this specific case that is not reachable and we can set the breakpoint. And for the kernel to be stuck indefinitely, we need the trap enlistment to point to itself, which is indicated by this next MRM flink points to itself. So it's effectively a trap enlistment because the kernel is trapped. And then when we are going to pass the different notification, we have added some code in order to detect that our trap enlistment has been touched by the kernel. And so after we have potentially won the race, we basically loop here and we're going to basically test that our trap enlistment flags potentially have their notifiable flag removed. And so if that's the case, it means the kernel touch our enlistment and removed our flag that we just set initially in the previous function I showed you. So now I'm executing the binary again. So now I go in the debugger and I'm gonna set the breakpoint I need. I'm gonna continue execution. So I'm in the variable function. I hit the breakpoint when it sends a notification, so I skip it at least 32 times. A few moments later. Now I'm gonna patch the memory. So the actual recovery thread is stuck. And I'm continuing execution and I can see the recovery thread is stuck. So now I can continue execution. We can see more than 32 enlistments have been notified. So now I break and I am patched the memory. So now I'm gonna disable this breakpoint. I'm gonna enable the breakpoint post post patch. However, in this case, I actually don't need to enable that particular breakpoint. Because basically, I just need to set the breakpoint for the actual superior case. So that's what I'm gonna do. So as you can see, only the breakpoint post race in the superior case has been set. So I'm going to continue execution and boom, it hits. So the fact it hits means that it actually triggered the code path for our user and enlistment. So in this case, we can see our 14 is our enlistment and we can see it's a username address
As we can see, our userland fake enlistment, the actual trap enlistment, points to itself here. It points to a K transaction that is also defined in userland. It has the flags, for now it has the notifiable flag and the superior flag set. We know it points to itself because R14 is C8D11E0. C8 D1. So we know it, it's actually an offset from the beginning of, of the canisment. And then if we look at the K transaction, we can see that the state is defined as K transaction in doubt. Okay, so I'll continue execution. No other breakpoint hits. I go back here. Nice. The user code actually detected the key enlistment is notifiable flag was unset. So we were able to detect from userland that we won the race. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching.